I think living to a hundred with preserved health span would be a wonderful thing. And even if it meant you lost a spouse, a child, it, it means you probably have three generations of people, you know, I mean, one of the questions I, I love asking my patients is, um, how many of your great grandparents can you name? So we all have eight great grandparents. And I say, tell me the names of them. I've only had one patient who could tell me two of them. Most people can't tell me a thing about one. I can't. I, I didn't even meet two of my grandparents. They died, you know, so young. Um, so if you think about that for a moment, and the reason I ask my patients this, by the way, has nothing to do with living longer. It's more about living better. It's basically, it's a way to remind everyone, myself included, that we're not that important. Like, <laughs> no matter, you know what I mean? Like, my point being is my great grandchildren will never know who I am. Uh, maybe in the age where they have video, they'll see a video of me or something, but like, I'm not going to be an important part of their life. Meaning the only people who I matter to are very narrow and close to me now. So let's not lose sight of that. Um, but these centenarians have a gift, right? Which is their great grandchildren will know them. And when you use this example, when you can go to concerts with your great grandchildren, that's amazing. When you could take a vacation with your great grandchild and, 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 and you're not only able to give them money for college, but you go to their graduation, think about the implication of how much of their life you've been a part of. So the flip side of everything I just said is I've never really met somebody who's dying at the age of 75. And that's a phenotype I've seen an awful lot in my training who didn't wish to have another year of life it could, if it could be had at a higher quality. Which now brings this whole discussion full circle. 9,999 out of 10,000 of us will not live to 100, directionally speaking. But if we want to live an extra year or five years, what is the most important lesson we can take away from the centenarian? that we can actually do something about. I want to start with uh, what you mentioned before, one of my darkest day in research, when Jay Leno in The Tonight Show said, you know, there's those people at Einstein and they said the secret for lo longevity is don't exercise, don't uh, <laughs> you know, be obese, don't do. And you know what he said? If you die, you don't care anyhow, right? And and that was the wrong lesson from the centenarian study. If you, <laughs> if you're going to be centenarian, maybe it's not important. By the way, it could be important for centenarians, right? I mean, this woman yep. that I have that smoked for 90 years and died at 110, I just wonder, wouldn't she be the next Madame Clement <laughs> without smoking? Um, so the, the lesson for most of us is still right? E exercise and nutrition, whatever it means to everyone and everything else that you give, right? That's, that's the lesson. And it's not the lesson from centenarians. The lesson from centenarians is that there are uh, longevity genes that could be translated into drugs. And I believe that they could afford uh, years of health span, however we want to define that. Uh, and, 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 and that's really what I'm trying to, to say that is a, not an emotional part, but, a, but a, a clinical part. Would you agree with my takeaway from this cohort, which is, because the, the single most important lesson I gleaned from everything we've said, and, and in addition to lots that we haven't said that you and I have talked about elsewhere or that my own work has you know, pointed me to based on my study of this problem, their superpower is simply delaying the onset of bad things. Like bad things just happen to them 20 to 25 years later. So it's not that they don't get heart attacks. They just don't get them when they're 65. It's not that they don't get cancer. They just don't get it when they're 60. It's not that they don't even get dementia. They just don't get it when they're 75. And when the last time I looked at the distribution of death for centenarians, it was shockingly similar to that of non-centenarians with a couple of differences. They tended to have a little more atherosclerosis, a little more heart attacks, a little less Alzheimer's disease, 
and I think a little bit more pneumonia. But directionally, they had the same actuarial table of death as people dying in their 80s. It was just a time shift. In fact, I, I, I reviewed the paper from Germany where they looked at the pathology. Okay, it's a pathological. Yeah. They looked at a thousand centenarians that over the years died in their homes. Mm. And they're right, because in the hospitals, we kill them in other ways, right? Yeah. So died in their homes versus thousand, I'm not sure about the numbers, of, of other people that died at their homes. And basically the paper was funny because the, the title was like, there's nothing special about the centenarians. They're dying for the same thing. But <laughs> 30 years later, okay, they missed the point. It was like a negative study, but you're <laughs> right. You're right. They're kind of dying from the same thing much later, much later on. So it's, you, you can look at it about what you said, the resiliency that got them there, the resiliency for anything that attacked them to get them there, or the fact that their aging was slow. <laughs> and so what's the takeaway for us? To me, the takeaway for us as physicians or people who want to have an extra five years of life or 10 years of life, even if we can't have an extra 20, is nothing matters more than prevention of chronic disease. And by the way, you don't get to prevent it once you have your heart attack. Secondary prevention is not prevention. Right. We're, we're talking ultra, ultra, ultra primary prevention. And if health span is something that the medical system hasn't been poised to teach, ultra primary prevention is also something that we haven't really been prepared to teach. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.